Our Gospel reading for this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel. It's a ways in to the story of Jesus. He's already begun his ministry, done many of the things for which he is famous. And by this time, the prophet John the Baptist is in prison. And that is where this is set. Prison was a little different in those days than it is now. Prison was not a place where you served sentences. Uh, Prison was a place you awaited your fate. Uh, While you were there, your friends were supposed to bring you food and support you, and uh, at some point you would be convicted, acquitted, something would happen. And that's where John is when today's reading takes place. So let us listen now for what the Spirit may speak to us through these words. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? What a strange question, or at least it is, coming from John the Baptist. When Jesus had come to him to be baptized in the Jordan, John had initially refused, saying, I need to be baptized by you. This was the one John had foretold, the one who would baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. What on earth would John want to baptize him for? But Jesus had insisted, saying that it was somehow necessary to fulfill all righteousness, and John had relented. Now, however, John seems to be having second thoughts. Maybe Jesus wasn't who he had thought he was, who John had hoped he was. Have you ever been really, really sure about something and then later come to doubt or even regret it? I had a a seminary classmate, I may have told you this before, a seminary classmate who, because of the call he felt to be a pastor, had gone back to college to get a degree so that he could be accepted into seminary. But he flunked out of his first seminary semester. I have no idea what happened to him after that. But I wonder if he still felt called. In today's economy, there are many who went to college assuming that when they pursued a degree and got that degree that there would be good, rewarding jobs waiting for them, but now such hopes seem to have evaporated for many. And some wonder about even 
have doubts about previous choices that they may have made. Six years ago, people bought houses knowing that the value could only go up. This country elected a black president and hoped that we had moved beyond racism, that we had turned a corner and entered a new era. But if anything, some racial tension seemed to have been inflamed. The list goes on and on. There's the coach who will finally turn things around for our team. There's the politician who will change the way things work in Washington. On a personal level, there's that acquisition that will make us happy, content, cool, or hip. There's that new job that's just perfect that will be fulfilling and financially rewarding. But things don't always quite work out as we plan. John the Baptist felt a call from God. He was called to help people get ready for something wonderful and new that was going to happen. God was about to change everything and people needed to prepare to repent, to clean the slate so they could be a part of this new thing. John said a Messiah was coming who was going to throw out the corrupt priest in the Jerusalem temple, who was going to lift up the oppressed and make sure Herod got what he deserved and restore Israel to glory. As John said about this Messiah to those who came out for baptism, see his winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Something's about to happen, folks, and you better get ready. But now John was in prison, waiting to see what Herod would finally do with him. As he awaited his fate, surely he had to know this wasn't going to end well. And so, as he looked around, it didn't seem that anything he expected was happening. Herod was still in power. The Romans were still in power. The temple priests were still in power. And the world didn't look a bit different. No wonder he sent some of his followers to Jesus asking, Are you the one? Luke's Gospel reports a, a similar sort of disappointment on the part of some of Jesus' own disciples on the day of Easter. Two of his disciples are traveling the road to Emmaus when they meet the risen Jesus, but do not recognize him. These two have already heard the women's story of an empty tomb and, and of an angel saying, Jesus is alive, and, and yet they say to this Jesus they don't recognize, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped he was the one, but hopes don't always pan out. I think that John the Baptist asked a question that a lot of church folks would like to ask, but we're not really willing to say it out loud. Are you the one? That's a big question, and who knows where it might lead. Asking such a question is a threat to some people's faith, and for other people, asking such a question forces them to define their faith. Best to leave it unsaid.
I wonder sometimes if the gradual evolution of Advent into a month-long Christmas celebration doesn't arise at least in some small part because of the avoidance of John's question. Christmas is about celebrating a wonderful, beautiful, joyful story without getting too deeply into the implications of that story, without worrying too much about the identity of that babe in the manger. Advent, on the other hand, is about preparing, getting ready, about fitting ourselves, conforming ourselves to the new day that that baby will bring, but that involves difficult questions about who Jesus is and who we are and what it means to follow him. Let's just celebrate Christmas. Are you the one? I'm not sure it's possible to be a Christian without answering that question in some way. And so it's a good thing that John the Baptist asked it for those of us who are scared or embarrassed or hesitant to ask it ourselves. One of my preaching commentaries says, it's a relief when someone else asks our question. It's doubly helpful when the one doing the asking is the brightest kid in the class. (laughs) When the one with all the answers doesn't know the answer. We don't feel so bad about not knowing the answer ourselves. And John the Baptist, this one Jesus says is the greatest prophet ever born, says, are you the one? Are you the one? Jesus answers, although it so often happens with Jesus, it's something of an elliptical answer. He begins to talk about his healing ministry. And as with health care in America, this had profound social implications. The lame and the blind and the deaf had no real possibilities in Jesus' world. There was nothing they could do besides beg. And Jesus ministers to this bottom tier of the society He says to John's followers, I proclaim good news to the poor, to the destitute, the oppressed. And as he finishes this answer for John, he concludes with a a curious line, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me, who doesn't stumble over Jesus, who isn't embarrassed or scandalized by him. But there's a lot about Jesus that bothers us, that embarrasses us, that offends us. He's always saying things that make us squirm. He's always insisting that we do things we would rather not do. At least the baby Jesus at Christmas doesn't cause any such problems. It's just a beautiful story with animals and angels and shepherds and hopes for peace on earth. But this is Advent, a time of preparing for this one who is coming, whom we are called to follow. And John asked that question that we so often avoid and which must be answered. Are you the one? Some time ago, Diane uh, noted to me that there are almost no images of Jesus anywhere in this church building. No pictures of him on the walls. No stained glass windows that depict him. Now, there's a lot of bad Jesus artwork out there. (laughs) And, and, And I'm not at all bothered by its absence. 
But when you consider the nearly complete absence, it's rather conspicuous when you start to think about it. What does your picture of Jesus look like? Perhaps more important, who is your Jesus? And how does he fit into your faith and into the hope and possibilities that we celebrate at Christmas? I mean, Jesus is the hinge point, the very center of the faith, the core. I'm not talking about that trivial, absurd, ridiculous, keep Christ and Christmas mess with Merry Christmas rather than Happy Holidays. I'm talking about Jesus as the very core of what it is we will celebrate, as the very core of the faith that we profess, as the very core of the life that we are called to live. And none of that makes a whole lot of sense. The Christian faith doesn't make a whole lot of sense if Jesus is not in some way the one. Are you the one? Jesus apparently is not the one John had been expecting. But Jesus invites John to look again and to see their God at work. And in this season of waiting and preparing and hoping, we would do well to engage John's question, to look again at Jesus, and hopefully discover that we can indeed glimpse the one who is to come. All praise and glory to the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Thanks be to God.